Okay, show begins. So I wanted to thank uh, all my colleagues at WITS for organizing this fantastic workshop and the safaris. Uh, so what I'll do today is to give you a kind of an overview of something which I've been working on for the past four or five years or so. And the subject is a little bit different from most of the talks uh, in this conference, uh, but it's of pretty general interest in quantum field theory, so I thought uh, you might find it fun. So this talk deals with some universal scaling properties of generic quantum field theories in a class of interesting situations which are far from equilibrium. And the reason why this could be actually interesting is because these properties are universal and universality means, among other things, that you can use results which you can calculate in model systems to real experiments which, can, which are not in, in their microscopic detail equivalent to the systems which you are considering. In fact, much of this work in this field is motivated by a recent class of fantastic cold atom experiments where people are able to study I mean, genuine non-equilibrium processes in great detail and under great control. It is remarkable that some of the properties have been discovered very recently. And one of the properties which I'll talk about were found, in fact, as a byproduct of explorations in the ADS-CFT correspondence, though the results have really nothing to do with holography, as we will see later on. So let me describe what I'll be talking about. <coughs> What I'm talking about is something called quantum quench, which is a name for the response of, re response of a system with a Hamiltonian which has a time-dependent parameter. The kind of time-dependence, I'll call this parameter a coupling always. So the, the, the kind of time-dependences we will study are uh, sort of given by this picture. Here is a coupling as a function of time. It has the property that it starts with some constant value at early time, so asymptotes move to that constant value, and it asymptotes to some other constant value, which could be the same as the original constant value at late times, and goes to some time dependence in the middle. Typically, one would start with the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian, where, I mean, the initial Hamiltonian being a time-independent Hamiltonian, there is a notion of a ground state. So you start with the ground state, and then the time dependence is going to excite the state. Or in other words, if you are thinking in the Heisenberg picture, the state at, is an excited state in terms of the new Hamiltonian at late times. <coughs> so, and we are going to consider various response functions of this system. The excited state then evolves non-trivially in time, and we are typically interested in a variety of questions of the resulting non-equilibrium state which is tending towards equilibrium. One set of questions which is of great interest both theoretically and nowadays even experimentally is the question of thermalization. So if you typically disturb a system in a time-dependent fashion and let it alone for some long enough time, one would expect that the injection of energy into the system will lead to some kind of thermalization. Of course, a pure state always evolves into a pure state. So one has to find, in fact, in what sense is the resulting sense approximately thermal. And there are various notions about how to do this in terms of local observables, in terms of entanglement properties of the state and so on. That's not what I'll talk about in this, in this talk. I'll rather talk about another set of questions, and these are the questions which relate to the universal properties. When this process of changing the coupling actually encounters of what would be a critical point in equilibrium. And the reason is that if, if the quench involves the vicinity of critical points, one expects that the subsequent time evolution carries some universal signatures of that critical point. And that's the kind of thing which I'll be exploring. 
and I'll be concentrating in particular of one important aspect is the scaling of expectation values. Typically in, in static critical phenomena, uh, one manifestation of universality is scaling. In non-equilibrium, much less is known about uh, in this, kind of, in this kind of behavior, but nevertheless we will find that there are some interesting scaling of these expectation values <coughs> of various quantities. Since we'll be talking about quantum quenches which go through or approach critical points, I will and I'll, I'll, be fun, I'll first discuss this in continuum quantum field theory, in, in particular relativistic quantum field theory, though in for many applications one actually needs to consider non-relativistic quantum field theory but I'll stick to the relativistic case. So one can write the action of this problem as a critical action, which could be typically a conformal field theory, with a, with a deformation with some operator which has some given conformal dimension delta, and I'll choose this oper to, operator to be a relevant operator. The coupling which sits in front of this operator is time dependent now. It's, this is something which in the literature is called a global quench because it does it's homogeneous in space, and the kind of time dependence I'll take is through a function, which is a function of time divided by a scale, which is delta t, which is the time scale of the quench in the problem. <coughs> the kind of these functions are given by pictures like this, and this has the property of lambda naught is the overall scale of the coupling, which sets the basic units in the system, and near the critical point, this coupling has a behavior which goes as some power of t. Okay. This, this, is, this is what you prescribe in the system. This is under your control. In real experiments, you will design a time dependence by some external magnetic field or something like that. And we want to study various responses. Is, is R positive? R is going to be positive and an integer. Most of the time, I'll deal with R equal to 1. They can be generalized. Uh, <coughs> To R3R. Mm -hmm. Near critical point mean where in this time direction? Near critical points mean lambda equal to zero. Oh, okay. When lambda is zero, it's a critical action. <coughs> okay. In fact, this problem was first studied many, many years ago in the 1970s by Tom Kibble, who was interested in, in the question of defect formulations in an expanding universe. So what, what Kegel asked the question is the, is the following. So he said in an expanding universe, we know that the, the, un, the, that the system goes through a series of phase transitions as the temperature becomes smaller and smaller. This was not really a quantum quench, but a thermal quench. And in particular, there could be phase transition depending on your choice of your grand unified theory or what have you, which are critical phase transitions. And typically in these transitions, defects are formed because of misalignment of, you know, of what could be a Higgs field in various regions of space, giving rise to various kinds of defects like monopoles and domain walls and cosmic strings. In particular, Kibble was interested in cosmic strings and he wanted to know, can I estimate the number density of these cosmic strings in a way which is robust and which is independent of the microscopic details of the problem. So he came up with a, with a very qualitative, in a way, but extremely robust, as we will find, argument of how to determine this. And this goes as follows. The time, the expanding universe provides the background time dependence of the various couplings in the problem. In this case, the temperature is like a coupling. And th these considerations are held, uh, hold, in fact, in a regime where this quench is slow. Now, I should say that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to couch this in a more modern language, not in the language which one Kibble did. Kibble did it for cosmology. It was extended by Zurek for condensed matter systems like liquid crystals. And in more modern days, it has been extended to quantum phase transitions by various people. So I will, I will couch this in the language of the quantum phase transitions. <coughs> so delta t is the time interval. This is delta t between these red lines, which during which the coupling is changing appreciably. So 1 upon delta t is the rate of quench. 
because that's the inverse of the time scale. So a slope wave, which is defined by the fact that delta t is larger than all physical length, length scales in the problem. In this case, for relativistic quantum field theory, the only scale in the problem is lambda naught. So whatever length scale you form out of lambda naught is given by this particular power. Delta is a conformal dimension of the quenched operator. So if the, if the profile of the coupling is like this, and we initially start with a round state, so what you would expect that when the coupling changes very, very slowly, and by definition the coupling changes very slowly compared to the initial gap, so therefore adiabatic, the adiabatic expansion should be a good approximation to calculate the time dependence of the wave function. So in the adiabatic approximation, of course, all expectation value follow behave as if they are in a Hamiltonian with a coupling which is the instantaneous value of the coupling. That's the lowest order adiabatic approximation. And in standard quantum mechanics textbooks, you learn how to compute corrections to this lowest order adiabatic approximation. Of course, here, here the situation is interesting because there is a time at which the coupling, this, uh, this coupling becomes zero. That means the system becomes critical. That means the gap becomes zero. So no matter how slowly you start out you know, changing the system, it's in physical, in terms of physical length scales, it becomes infinitely fast at that point. Before it becomes infinitely fast, there will be a time at which the adiabatic expansion breaks down. So you cannot use adiabatic perturbation theory to calculate things anymore. Now, in usual quantum mechanics, there are very few methods to calculate things in a time with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. One is, of course, perturbation theory when the when the you know when the couplings are very small. That's what we use typically in quantum field theory, like Feynman diagrams and so on. The other is, of course, is the adiabatic approximation. There is a third one, which is called the sudden approximation, which I'll come to later on. But typically, when none of these things work, it is very difficult to compute things in, in, quantum, in quantum mechanics. So what Kimmel assumed is that, okay, to lowest order, what I will assume, and this, I should warn you, is a very drastic assumption. Nobody knows why it actually works. He said, at this time, which is called the kibble zurek time, which is minus t, which is this red line here, he assumed as the adiabatic evolution breaks down to lowest order, I will assume that the system just becomes diabatic. A system becoming diabatic means that I can now use the sudden approximation. A sudden approximation means that all quantities are frozen to the value which it had at minus t kz. Okay? So between these red lines, the assumption was the system is basically frozen. Okay. There's a second assumption they made, and the second assumption they made was from experience in equilibrium critical behavior. In equilibrium critical behavior, scaling follows from ideas of the renormalization group. And one of the main points about the renormalization group is that in the scaling region, as like in continuum quantum field theories, there are only a few length scales or few couplings which contribute to long distance quantities. Those are the couplings which are with relevant operators and with time scales. And this is a situation where there is only one relevant operator. So they assume that in this region, the instantaneous correlation length at minus t k z, which by assumption is the same between minus t k z and plus t k z, is the only length scale in the problem. Okay? You can easily calculate what these times are, and I'll just go through this calculation because it's quite trivial and Therefore, you know, it's also not quite accurate. So the gap, instantaneous energy gap in the system is given by this expression. The thing which is inside is that time-dependent coupling. This z is what's called the dynamical critical exponent, which tells you how length and scale, length, lengths and distances and time scale. And nu is the standard correlation uh, length exponent of the corresponding critical point. So if this is a gap, it became a function of time because we're looking at the instantaneous energy gap. And the adiabatic expansion is called, oh, 
The adiabatic expansion is controlled by this quantity, which is the derivative of the energy gap divided by the gap squared, as appears in adiabatic perturbation theory. And the Landau criterion tells you that this object has to be much smaller than one for the adiabatic expansion to work. Therefore, I can determine the time at which this thing, uh, the adiabatic expansion fails by requiring this quantity to be order one. Plugging this into that, you get that Tkz is given by this quantity. And using the assumption that this is the only scale in the problem, therefore every quantity has to scale as some power of that scale by an appropriate dimensional analysis. And this immediately gives a scaling result, for example, for the one point function as a function of the quench rate. Mm -hmm. Yes? Stupid question. Uh, that expression, you know, just by dimension, should be one over some. There should be some, some speed of light because it doesn't need times speed. Speed of light is, uh, this is a relativistic thing, I've taken speed of light to be one. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so everything is just raised to the, the dimension of that operator. I really know the instantaneous, uh, instantaneous energy gap is in the base function. How is the? The, the, the first equation. The first equation? Yes. So if, they, if, if, they, if, if, if I had a, uh, if I had a deformation of a conformal field theory by some operator, right? So then that's by scaling, then the energy gap will be an appropriate power of that of, of that coupling, because there's nothing else in the theory. The instantaneous energy gap is, is by definition the energy gap of a static system whose coupling is the coupling at that time. So that's how this one. Essentially Yeah, yeah. Critical phenomena, everything is dimensional analysis. <coughs> So you are considering the second order phase transition? Second order, always critical transition, yes. <clears throat> okay, there is an improved version of this, the, because you know, it, it's quite unrealistic to, to assume that right after the adiabaticity breaks down the system gets frozen, there must be some time evolution. And this improved version is also in the spirit, these are all conjectures. Improved version follows the story of what we usually do in equilibrium critical phenomena. We introduce scaling functions. Here there are scaling functions which are functions of time. For example, a one point function would be this overall power which came from dimensional analysis as I just showed you, times some function which is some slowly varying smooth function, analytic function of t upon tkz. The fact that there is universality sort of built into this game by saying that it is not a separate function of time and some microscopic length scale in the problem. The only length scale in the problem is Tkz. That's why it has to appear in that ratio. There is a similar uh, conjecture for scaling functions for correlators, which I have just written down here. I'll not talk too much about it. The initial assumptions of Kibble and Zurek are, of course, too simplistic, as you might have, uh, might have guessed by now. Nevertheless, the fact is that these scaling laws hold for a large variety of theoretical models and in fact there is fair amount of evidence that it actually holds in real experiments. So it must be correct. So the figure out, uh, the problem is figure out why is it correct to get a better understanding. Do you have any example this doesn't work? Do you have any example this doesn't work? I don't think there are examples known where, where it definitely known it doesn't work. There are examples known where certain parts of this mechanism work, but people don't quite know whether the scaling works as perfectly as okay, this. So you say only people don't know why that it works, you say? In most cases, one knows that it works. It, in some cases, one doesn't. The experiments are not good enough to tell you what the exponents are. Okay. <coughs> Since there is very little understanding, so some time ago we thought that maybe casting this problem in a holographic setup might help us in understanding something of this. So let me describe to you how that works. See the holographic setup, like in area safety correspondence, field theory couplings becomes boundary conditions for bulk dual fields. So for example, if I had a scalar operator in the field theory, there, is a, there should be some dual field, which is a scalar field. The asymptotic expansion of this dual field is quite standard. In, I've written down this in Poincaré coordinates. 
and the two integration functions which appear in that solution are identified with the source and the expectation value. Therefore, a time-dependent coupling of the, of the field theory basically becomes a time-dependent boundary condition in the bulk physics. A time-dependent boundary condition in the, in the regime, if there is a regime where the, the bulk physics can be written in terms of differential equations, namely what we usually call the supergravity regime, then it's a problem of solving a set of PDEs with some time-dependent boundary condition, which is not necessarily a very easy problem, but nevertheless, it is a problem which is very perfectly posed. I mean, you can, I mean, a good numerical theorist will be able to calculate uh, these things. An important aspect of this, I said, is thermalization of the field theory. And what, so what, what, are you, what is the picture of this thermalization in the bulk language? Is that, of course, it's like ADS is like a tin can, and what you are doing is you're sort of beating the ends of the can. That's a time-dependent boundary condition. You're sort of driving the system by some external force. And what it would do, of course, it, is to send some waves into the bulk, and this being a gravitational theory, this wave will, you might expect, under generic situations, the waves collapse and form a black hole. And once the black hole is formed, then at very late times, so this, this is a kind of a, a cartoon Penrose diagram for this process, and once a black hole is formed, then at late times, if I measure correlators, which are, you know, close enough, then it will only see the exterior geometry of the black hole, which has become static by that time. Now that's like a thermal geometry, and those correlators will have some thermal behavior. Yeah? How do you know it's whatever the field that you have, if you deform it, how do you know it's always from the black hole? No, you don't know. This, this, is, this is an expectation. There are cases where it is known that it doesn't happen. Yeah, so you have to drive it faster than the gap. Exactly. Yeah, that's obvious. Yeah. Yeah. If there is a gap, of course, I mean, you have to overcome the gap. Right. But even, even with a gap, I mean, yes, it turns out that under genetic situations, it will not form a black hole in the first time. It will rattle around for quite a number of times. And for a large and generic class of initial conditions, as argued by Bizarre and Rostrovsky in a very famous paper, uh, it will eventually form more small black holes. So I think it's sort of expected in ADS. There are important ex ex exceptions to this which I will not call, talk about. But as I said, I will not discuss this problem which has been studied in great detail by a large number of authors over many, many, many years. I will talk about a problem which involves a quantum quench along the critical point. So for that we need to identify a bulk theory which is dual to a critical point. We need to impose time-dependent boundary conditions on the field, which is dual to a relevant operator at that critical point, and we want to calculate the response. So this is something which we did in a, in a series of papers starting in 2012, and I'll give you one example of how, how this thing actually works and what it actually teaches us, and that example was studied in this paper with Balla Basu, Vittakadas, and Patsu this problem, <coughs> uh, this, this particular example has got to do with a model of a zero temperature holographic superfluid which was written down by uh, these people, uh, Ryu Takayagi and Shioka, uh, quite some time ago. And what it involves is, it, this is one of those, what are these called, bottom up or top down, I forgot, whichever, whichever way it is, you write down the bulk. Lagrangian and you hope that there is some uh, thing. In this case, it's a little bit better because... <coughs> bottom up. Bottom up, okay. This is bottom up, but you can also think of it as... A, there are top-down versions of this which, are, which have been made by other people. So, there is a, this is the bulk action, this is the Einstein piece, there is a Maxwell piece, and there is a charged scalar. This is not quite the action what they wrote down. They, were, they didn't have this thing, but... We actually modified this by putting in uh, uh, a quadric coupling just for uh, usefulness. It's not necessary. Okay? Doesn't it make the numerics much worse? Say that again? Doesn't it make the numerics much worse? 
No, it mean, makes the numerics much easier because there is a probe approximation now where you can just deal with the scalar and not the scalar coupled with Maxwell. That's where we did it. We did it again with, without this term, nothing changes as you would expect. The thing about this is that uh, you make one of the space directions compact. In string theory, you are going to put in supersymmetry breaking boundary conditions on that compact direction. And what you would have is, the if I, if I didn't have any of this stuff, that, then it is known that what the dual is, is an ADS soliton. Okay. In the presence of the gauge field, what these people did was to say, okay, let me just put in a gauge field and put in a gauge field which is just a constant, you know. So that would correspond to a chemical potential of the boundary field theory. So first let us put the scalar field to zero, then it turns out that for sufficiently small mu, which is the chemical potential of the dual field, the solution of the ADS, uh, Einstein-Maxwell theory is an ADS soliton in the presence of a constant AT. Okay. <coughs> however, <coughs> however, even with a, with a vanishing lambda T, what turns out that if you have a mu which is large enough, this solution is not stable. Instead, so this is the statement here, this is again, I have just written down that asymptotic condition. Uh, so even with a vanishing uh, lambda of t, this lambda of t here is the non-normalizable part of the phi, the solution is not energetically, it's thermodynamically unstable when the chemical potential is larger than some critical value. Instead, what happens is that there is now a non-trivial solution of the full non-linear equations of motion and that non-trivial solution means there is a non-trivial normalizable part of the field. A non-trivial normalizable part of the field means that there is an expectation value of the dual operator. So, this is a condensation. So, what we are seeing is a spontaneous symmetry breaking of a global U1 which is why it is called a superfluid. You can actually, near the critical point, you can calculate the exponents in this particular model with this, uh, this non-linear coupling. And I've give you, given you what those, uh, what those the things are. If the potential we have introduced is like a phi to the sum power, you can calculate what the, what the expectation value of that operator is <coughs> as a function of mu minus mu c and also as a function of this, uh, of this non-linear term. Okay. It's sort of interesting to learn why does a, such a thing happen and this is actually quite standard in, in this class of models of holographic superconductors. The way it happens is that if you look at the scalar field equation, then uh, the linearized operator of that equation which I have denoted by, it, they can always be written as a kind of a Schrodinger operator. That linear operator, under normal circumstances, you can find that the spectrum of this linearized operator is positive. However, there is a chemical potential. What that chemical potential actually does is to produce a mass term in the, in the effective equations for the scalar. So, as a result, uh, there is some value of the chemical potential where that the full linearized operator acquires a zero mode. In terms of the Schrodinger problem, I'm losing that picture. Some of the picture didn't come. In terms of the Schrodinger problem, what it means is that you develop a threshold bound state in the Schrodinger problem. If you go beyond that value of the chemical potential, you will develop a real bound state, and that would be the instability. Okay. So let's now go to the situation where we turn on a source which couples to that particular operator and drive it with some function of time. How am I doing in terms of time? Uh, about halfway. Halfway. Good. So as I said, at all the times one can perform a time derivative approximation of the classical equations of motion. Now, now you have some, you have some PDEs, a time derivative expansion is just quite straightforward to do. And that you can do and you can figure out when does this time derivative expansion break down. And this is the answer for this particular model. It's uh, there is some fractional powers 
which are actually related to the kind of non-linearity the system has. Okay? Now, we didn't want to do what Kibble, repeat what Kibble did, namely to assume, Kibble assumed that right after this breaks down, it, the system gets frozen. We don't want to do that. We want to actually start in the time evolution in that regime. So, this is what we did. Now, an adiabatic expansion means that there is a power series expansion on inverse powers of delta t because that's a time derivative expansion. So, when it breaks, this means that power series expansion is not valid anymore. What we found rather surprisingly, and this is something which you can find by just by analyzing the system of equations without even solving them, is that in the critical regime, that means near t equal to zero, there is a new expansion and for small value, large values of delta t, except that that new expansion is not a power series expansion in delta t inverse, it's an expansion in fractional powers of delta t. Those fractional, the, the fraction which is required in this expansion, and you can perform, you know, this, you can write down how this expansion works, are determined by the original critical exponents which are there in the problem. Okay? So in this case, it turns out that this power series expansion is in powers of delta t minus to the power minus two fifth. This actually happens in equilibrium critical behavior as well. Yes. You have a question. So all of what you're saying is for the specific bulk cell you mentioned. This, everything is for the specific theory. Yes. Uh, we had many, many specific theories. It always works this way. You if you change the potential of the specific Yeah. So the, the, what, what happens when you change the potential is the numbers change. That's all. That's yeah. all that happens. The fraction of R V T minus Q over 5 change, but some, some power. Yeah, it's always some power. Yeah, okay, always. I, I figured in this example, did you pick a dimension? Hmm? Did you pick a dimension? Are we in 4D or 3D? Yeah. Oh, this was a 5D, I mean, ADS5. Yeah. 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 It, it actually works, this result yeah, is for ADS5, ADS but you can do it for ADS, mm -hmm. for some reason we did ADS D plus 2, I don't know. But then, yeah. Whatever. This then the 2 fifth becomes something else. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so what you do is that you do this expansion in fractional powers of delta t inverse, so delta t raised to the power minus 2 fifth in this case, and you look at the equations in this expansion. So what you find is that in the lowest order of this expansion, there is only one mode of the bulk field which dominates this. So let me explain what, what, what do I mean by that. So you have a PDE. You have a function which is a function of time and the radial coordinate of ADS. Okay? So it's a partial differential equation for that. You can reduce this PDE to an infinite set of ordinary differential equations by performing a spectral decomposition in terms of that operator in the radial direction. That's a standard trick. So th that way you have an infinite set of ordinary differential equations in terms of modes which are eigen modes of a corresponding radial differential operator. So that's that, those are the modes I'm talking about. And you can look at this coupled set of equations and immediately discover that in the critical regime to lowest order in this expansion, that zero mode which actually led to the, uh, to the phase transition to begin with, that zero mode completely determines the dynamics. The contribution of all the other modes are subdominant in this expansion. What that means, they, then you look at the equation for this mode and you immediately find there is a scaling solution for this equation. And the scaling solution tells you that this uh, delta size, size that bulk field, scales as some power of delta t. Once you have that scaling solution, this implies a kibble durek scaling law for the expectation value of the corresponding operator. You can compute the corrections to this leading scaling behavior in that expansion in fractional powers of delta t, and you know, compute what happens to this. They're not very interesting in this particular case. So what this was done without solving any of these equations. Uh, luckily, I had collaborators who were good in numerics. So they actually went ahead and solved the, you know, the, those PDEs 
uh, on a computer, and these are some pictures of how this uh, uh, the, the expectation value scales as a function of time. And this is a picture which nicely shows that the scaling behavior which you obtain from this expansion is indeed correct in the exact solution. <coughs> okay. As I said, this I showed it for a particular model with the people us and yeah. What was the oscillating? Hmm? The picture you showed. Why was why were there oscillations? Uh, oh, those oscillations are uh, sort of expected. So uh, this is a situation which you go from a gapped phase to another gapped phase, going through a critical point. Since the final phase is gapped. So any time dependence will have an e to the i m t, where m is the gap. So in fact, the period of that oscillation is basically given by that. <laughs> OK. This was the result in a probe approximation, where only the scalar field is important. So we went ahead and uh, uh, did, a, did a study of the back reaction with uh, Takeshi Morita. Uh, the back reaction of this thing, and we found that the scaling laws continue to hold uh, in the critical region, so it gives you scaling laws for the energy momentum tensor as well as for the charge density. Okay, so as I said, I showed this for this uh, one particular model, but it, us and other people have looked at various kinds of models of this. It always works this way. There is a zero mode. There is a dominance of the zero mode in the dynamics in the critical region, leads to a scaling solution and leads to Kibble Zurich scale. So, following this, Bouchel, Lenner, Myers, and Van Leeker looked at the opposite regime of quantum quench holographically. So, we were dealing with, an in the, what, so far, what I was talking about was quantum quench, which was slow compared to the initial gap. They looked at the regime where the quench was fast compared to the initial gap. And they found, by solving the Einstein equations numerically, that there is a different scaling law which appears. And what happened? Okay. And this is the scaling law, namely in the same setup, but in a different regime, you have some different powers of delta t which appears <coughs> in this. In fact, there is a kind of understanding of this, as a semi-analytic understanding of why this happens from the ADS point of view. So looking at this, we figure that this is too good to be only special for holography. It, it must be something which is quite general. So we decided to look at uh, just regular quantum field theory, no connection to the ADS CFT correspondence, a quantum field theory with a time dependent coupling, the, exactly the action which I uh, displayed in the beginning of the talk. So, exactly this thing with some, some lambda of t. And after experimenting with some specific models, those models are typically free field theories with time dependent mass. We are then arrived actually at a general proof of the scaling relations which are valid for arbitrary interaction quantum field theories. The way it goes is as follows. So once again you have an action, it's a relativistic theory. We assume that the critical action is actually a conformal field theory and a relevant uh, deformation with some time dependent coupling. The time dependent coupling can be very general. It has to only have the property that uh, it starts with some constant, it turns off at, turn at some, some time, which I, which I call t equal to zero, and up it does various things in between that time and the time t equal to delta t, and settles down to some other constant. Okay. There are several scales in the problem, the maximum value of lambda, the minimum value of lambda, the original lambda, the final lambda, the fast regime is defined to be the regime where delta t is smaller than all the scales in the problem. It's the smallest length scale in the problem. Okay. <coughs> so given such a situation, you might be tempted to calculate the response of the theory by starting with perturbation theory and see if this perturbation theory actually works. So I've written down for you the first few terms of time-dependent perturbation theory <coughs> the, the first term is the linear response, 
which contains a retarded correlator, the retarded two-point function is the two-point function of this quenched operator O with the suitable theta function. The second term I have written down is the second order motivation with which has some three-point function with some order which I will not even talk about. All quantities here are renormalized quantity. We are doing renormalized quantum field theory. They can always be suitably renormalized by subtracting, for example, by subtracting the adiabatic expansion of these quantities. Namely, you can compute these quantities in adiabatic perturbation theory. This will involve terms, the counter terms, which involve lambda as well as its time derivatives. And if you subtract those out, then you got get rid of all the UV problem, have some uh, all the UV contributions, and you get a renormalized alter. Consider the first term in this expansion, the linear response. It's an integral of the retarded Green's function with this function. This function is the profile of the coupling. There's an integral over time. And let me compute this at a time. See, the upper limit of this integration is the time at which you are computing that response. And this integral is, is integral over all space, as it, as it would appear, follow from the action. Now, this integral is a finite over a finite domain from 0 to t, whereas this integral over is on entire space, but this is a causal Green's function. Because it's a causal Green's function, this space integral is actually restricted also to, to a region which is of order t. Namely, if I measure at that time, I should call it delta t, this is t. Yeah forget about the delta, you just look at the past null cone of, of, of that point and the region of x integration is over, you know, the intersection of the null cone with the t equal to 0 hypersurface. Now suppose I want to compute this quantity in at early times, namely t of the order of delta t. That means this delta x, namely x minus x prime over which this integral is done, is also up to order delta t. It cannot exceed that. What that means is that by definition, the scale delta t is more than all other physical scales in the problem, in particular, the scale which is associated with the deformation which is given by lambda naught. Therefore, the Green's function this Green's function which appeared there is not a conformal Green's function to begin with. It was the Green's function of the original theory, which was a conformal field theory with a perturbation, which is given by lambda naught. However, in this regime, we are looking only at Green's functions which are at distances and times which are much smaller than the gap. Those Green's functions to lowest order are in fact the conformal field theory Green's function, almost by definition. So therefore, I can replace this by the CFG Green's function. That means that in that expression, there are only two scales which appear in the problem. The first scale is, of course, lambda naught, which was there in the perturbation of the relevant operator. The second scale is delta t. What this means is that by dimensional analysis, the first term I know is proportional to delta t. In fact, you can organize this, this expansion as an expansion of in terms of a dimensionless coupling and the dimensionless coupling is made up by the original coupling and then appropriate power of delta t. By definition, this coupling is small in the fast quench regime, so you can trust this perturbation expansion, which in general you wouldn't be able to trust because this is not a naive perturbation theory. And therefore, in the first term, you can easily see that what you get is that universal scaling law. There is a similar argument for the energy density which is produced. And since the coupling remains constant after delta t, whatever energy is produced is produced during the quench. After that, it remains constant. So this gives you a prediction of how the energy density scales even at very late times. Okay. I would like to emphasize that the result is completely general 
it only depends on the property of the UV conformal field theory. It does not depend on what that relevant perturbation is taking you to, whether it taking, takes you to another fixed point or whether it goes to a massive theory is completely relevant to this discussion. Since it is related only to the properties of the conformal field theory in the ultraviolet, the results are therefore universal. That's always the reason why things are universal. We did some explicit calculations in free field theories and time dependent masses and also some calculations in conformal field theory. Much more recently, but, uh, a little bit earlier, Bernstein and Miller and recently Dimarski and Smolin have done some detailed con uh, conformal perturbation theory calculations and verified this and other scaling, uh, scaling relations which uh, we have predicted. As I will now show that this result is actually very puzzling. And so before I tell you why it is puzzling, let me tell you the extreme limit of quantum quench where a coupling suddenly changes at some value of time. From one, so we go from one Hamiltonian to the other Hamiltonian at some time. So what this means is that the, the ground state of H0 in the Heisenberg picture remains that state, but it is no longer the ground state of the new Hamiltonian. So it's an excited state of the new Hamiltonian. Cardi and Calabrese argue that such a quaint state, it's a typically a very complicated state, but if the final theory is a conformal field theory, they argue that this can be approximated very well by what is called a boundary state. And this is the form of the boundary state acted upon by an exponential which involves the final CFT Hamiltonian, which I call H1. Of course, in 1 plus 1 dimensions, there is a lot of power in conformal field theory. So they went ahead and calculated various quantities, various expectation values of quantities in that state. And I'll give you some of the results. One interesting result, for example, is a one-point function of some generic operator and you want to find out what is the time dependence of this operator. You can, using this, you can show that this goes exponentially in time. So there is a relaxation time. The relaxation time which is involved is not universal. It depends on the parameter tau naught. That parameter depends on the initial Hamiltonian and therefore it is not universal. However, if you compute the ratios of relaxation times, they become ratios relaxation times of two different operators, they become ratios of the conformal dimensions of those two operators and that's a universal prediction of, the, of this theory. Nowhere in this calculation, you, I mean this is a perfectly well-defined calculation in conformal field theory which you can do and looks to be perfectly fine. There are some proviso's which I have just mentioned here. Let us now go back to the calculation which we did that that prediction that the expectation value of the operator goes as some power of delta t. And if you look at the power, you immediately realize that when 2 times delta, delta is the dimension of that operator by which you have deformed the theory, is greater than the space-time dimension d, this thing diverges in the delta t going to zero limit. Whereas in all these calculations of a sudden quench, there doesn't seem to be any such problem. The reason why these things look so different, of course, is that we were calculating things in renormalized quantum field theory. By definition, the renormalized quantum field theory can only deal with length scales which are much, much larger than the UV scale in the theory, the UV cutoff in the theory. The cutoff has been sent to infinity by the renormalized they should go to procedure. So even though I said it's a fast quench, that means that delta t, while much, much smaller than the inverse mass gap of the initial theory, is necessarily much larger compared to the lattice spacing or the UV scale, uh, UV scale which is involved. Whereas in an instantaneous quench, but almost by definition, you got to do a change which is fast compared to all scales in the theory, which includes the UV cutoff. So that's why the things are different. 
Nevertheless, it is quite interesting and useful to study how does one approach this abrupt limit. Okay. In order to do that, we decided to look for ultraviolet finite quantities in some solvable theories. I'll give you examples of these ultraviolet finite quantities so you don't get confused by issues of the cutoff. Okay. So these are some examples, some sample computations uh, of in, a, in a scalar field theory or fermion field theory with some time dependent masses. The trick is to find the time dependent mass so that you can solve the problem exactly. Namely, you can solve the Heisenberg equations of motion exactly and therefore calculate all quantities as a function of time in an exact fashion. Okay, so here are some mass profiles which does the job. If you wish, this is the solution. There is nothing very interesting about it except that there is a solution in terms of hypergeometric functions. So, what we do is obtain exact analytic expressions for arbitrary quench rates in terms of integrals of these hypergeometric functions. We cannot compute those integrals analytically and those computations we just perform numerically. And we take various limits of the quench rate. Here are some results of an interesting ultraviolet finite quantity which is the excess energy. This is defined as the energy density at very late times subtracted by the what would be the ground state energy at that time. Because you have done the subtraction, all the UV has been subtracted out and you are left with a finite object. And these are results for this, for example, for the scalar field theory. The thing which you notice is that for low dimensions, this quantity has a smooth limit as delta t goes to zero. In fact, it approaches a finite number which depends on the initial mass. And that finite number in fact agrees with what you have the instantaneous in, in the result for an instantaneous quench. The subleading terms agree with the scaling relation which I just derived. If you go to higher dimensions, you start encountering situations where in the delta t going to limit, this object actually diverges, that for d equal to 4 it diverges as a log, for d greater than equal to 5 it diverges as some power. Those are exactly those scaling laws, delta t raised to the power d minus 2, the 2 delta which I, which I derive. And if you perform the same computation in an instantaneous quench for this theory, you get an infinite answer from a UV divergence. So everything seems to agree. For general interacting theories, we don't have a very solid argument of how this works, but this is the conjecture. For delta less than d upon 2, one expects there is a smooth limit of the excess energy density to instantaneous quench and the subleading quantity scales in universal fashion. For 2 delta greater than d, the excess energy diverges exactly in the way predicted by the scaling law. This part has been sort of verified in explicit uh, performance perturbation theory calculations recently. Uh, let me skip this part, you will probably like out of time. So there are other UV finite quantities which you can examine and you know learn something out of it. But all these results are in continuum field theory. To explore the entire range of quench rates from abrupt quench to slow quench, we need to understand this in with a finite lattice spacing. This is also important if these results are to be relevant to any experiment, but experiments always have a finite lattice spacing, like in cold atom experiments. So, what we decided to do is to look for some standard lattice theories where the problem is again solvable. And we took two models which are interesting in condensed matter physics. The first is almost like a harmonic oscillator of condensed matter physics, which is the transverse field Ising model. The second one is a very interesting model which has been written by, by Kitaev, which apparently is interesting for quantum computations for reasons I do not know. Uh, but it's an interesting model. So this model is just a chain of spins which is this Hamiltonian and we want to study this with a time dependent transverse field which is G of T. The second model is 
written on what is called a honeycomb lattice in two space dimensions and it involves Pauli matrices of all the three kinds with some couplings which are specified by this. Now typically two dimensional lattice models are almost never solvable. It's only one dimensional lattice models are solvable and the reason why the Kitaev model is very famous is that Kitaev showed that you can solve this model in exactly in equilibrium. The reason why you can solve this model exactly in equilibrium is that you can actually invent a jordan wigner transformation which brings you to a single Majorana fermion or a pair of Majorana fermions which have a Hamiltonian in our time dependent context which is of the following form. So sigma 1 and sigma 3 are the standard Pauli matrices. Chi is, uh, is there are two Majorana fermions which I have organized in terms of, uh, of a two component spinner, chi 1 and chi 2. So for the Eisen model, this object is that, this object is this, for the Kitar model, that object is this, and this object is this. And the Eisen model has another condition which tells you that this 2D spinner is actually Majorana. In the, in the Kitar model, it's just a Dirac fermion. This is a free fermion theory. So clearly, if the couplings were constant, I could have solved the theory completely. And that's what Kitaev and many other people did. It's interesting that the Kitaev model has actually a variety of critical, critical behaviors. The Eisen model, of course, has a single isolated critical point. This is the critical point where around which the continuum theory is the standard theory of a Majorana fermion in 1 plus 1 dimensions. And that's what I've written down here. So a time-dependent theory a time-dependent uh, uh, parameter of this theory just corresponds to a time-dependent mass of the Majorana fermion in the continuum limit. In the lattice, it actually corresponds to a mass which is time and momentum dependent, which is a bit strange. Let me quickly, I have, do I have five minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So in the Kitara model, I said there are three couplings. So here are the three couplings. If you take a point, there are three links which are coming out of the point, and they couple various, you know, various spins, various uh, sigma operators. You can easily show by using this fermion formulation that if the three values of the couplings lie can form three sides of a triangle, then you have a critical point. Of course, there are many solutions to that. So therefore, there is an extended critical region. In the J1, J2, J3 plane, there is a whole region where every point is critical. That's another reason why this model is interesting. So I've written down the conditions for criticality here. And there are actually three distinct classes of behavior, critical behavior, which I'll just illustrate by freezing two <coughs> of these couplings to be a constant and the third coupling to be time dependent. In this picture, forget about the time dependence, these two lines, if the coupling lines between these two lines, you have a critical point. Okay, so every point is critical in here. And the critical point at the edge and the critical point at the interior, and there's a critical point in the middle, those have different critical behavior. They have different exponents, they have different approaches to the critical point. And therefore, by standard renormalization group, the continuum limits of the theories which you construct around each of these points are different. So I've written down those continuum limits in three different boxes. I don't expect you to follow this, but you can write down what the continuum theories are. And they're sort of interesting in their own rights. So we want to invent time dependences which are exactly solvable for a finite lattice basis. And it turns out that you can find those time dependences and you have a Hamiltonian like that to solve it in a textbook fashion by finding the positive and negative frequency spinners, writing down the mode expansion and then you calculate in things. So this is quite standard, so I'll not give you down. So once again, you get momentum integrals, the integrand is in terms of Horrid hypergeometric functions, 
But Mathematica understands what those functions are, so you can numerically calculate what these answers are. So let me give you a sample example of what you get. Here are the results for the transverse phase IZ model. So what I have done is that I have taken uh, a, a, a particular time dependence in this field, they are called protocols. And this is the increasing value of delta T. So it's a slow quench here and it's a very fast quench for small values of delta T. And what we find is sort of what we expect is that, that for large values of delta T, the response is consistent with what you expect for the kibble zurek scaling. That, that's what we showed in the continuum theory as well. For there is a saturation of this <laughs> as a function of delta T, which happens when, which agrees with what you expect from an instantaneous quench. However, there is an intermediate regime between very slow quenches and completely abrupt quenches where this new scaling law holds. For the guitar model, this is even more interesting because you sort of encounter new exponents which corresponds to the new varieties of critical particles. Okay. There is actually a physical understanding of this saturation of this, of this response as a function of delta t, and which is very simple. So the point is, on a lattice, the, we are considering infinite lattices, but a finite lattice spacing. So the momenta are still continuous, but they are bounded in the Brillouin zone with, uh, from minus pi to plus pi. So as the system, this uh, as the system is driven, a mode which is labeled by this momenta successively falls out of equilibrium. It loses the adiabaticity. As you would expect, the mode which first loses adiabaticity is the mode with the lowest energy, which is the mode at k equal to zero. And then as you proceed, further and further modes start losing adiabaticity. But here k is bounded, is bounded from minus pi to plus pi, so there would be a time at which all the possible modes have lost idea of city. And it turns out that's precisely the point where these curves, these curves appear saturation. This is this, this line, I don't know, it's probably wrong line. It's around this point where this thing happens. So we could calculate that in that model and, you know, and then compare with these answers and find a perfect agreement. <coughs> so this, we believe has to be quite generic. A fast quench, so that's a saturation. A fast quench regime, which was predicted in continuum quantum field theory, exists in this lattice system as well. And this exists when the rate is slow compared to the lattice scale, but fast compared to the physical mass scale. So therefore, this should be something which one should be able to see in real experiments. As I said, real experiments have a finite lattice spacing because you sort of put cold atoms on a lattice and do, do various things to them. Finally, for rates which are slow compared to physical scales, one gets, as expected, a kibble direct scaling regime with exponent also predicted by the continuum theorem. There are some results for the Kitaev, which I will not go through. And finally, I won't have the time to explain this, but uh, I would just tell it in words. In order to understand the nature of the final quantum state, one of the quantities which is interesting is the entanglement entropy. And that's also is something we computed in a class of models. And what we found that the entanglement entropy at early times also has interesting scaling, universal scaling behavior. And so that's something which is sort of new. Uh, we haven't been able to we are in the process of trying to uh, understand this in generic quantum field theories, uh, in, in using conformal perturbation theory, but that's sort of all in progress. So let me wrap up instead of going through this with an epilogue. So the lesson of the story is that there is an interesting universal behavior 
and quench rate for intermediate scales between the UV and physical mass scales of the problem. And in this regime, the results which we have demonstrated should be something which should be can be proved in experiments. We have mostly concentrated these scaling results are early time results. Namely, they are results of a response of the system at times pretty soon after the quench. Of course, some of these results are also valid at late time. These are results for conserved quantities. Because after the quench is over, whatever that conserved quantity is attained just remains constant till arbitrary late times. However, uh, it, it would be interesting to explore what this universality has got to say with late time behavior of quantities and their implications to thermalization. Namely, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the approach to thermalization should be connected to the critical behavior through which the system has gone through. And this is something which I think can be studied in, in generality. In particular, it would be interesting to see how the approach, how the dynamics of the entanglement and entropy is related to this critical behavior. And this is something which has been studied in very great detail, but only for abrupt quenches. But uh, uh, these, these scalings have got to do with how things behave as a function of the quench rate, which people haven't quite studied yet. And this is something we are also looking at. I would finally like to say with the statement that, uh, I mean, we all do string theory in one form or the other, uh, but very often we find that string theory addresses questions in general quantum field theory or in general gravity, you know, what have you say, and it, 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 it lets you think about these problems in a way which is a little bit different from a direct approach. And it also happens that once you do that, then you arrive at results which you realize has really nothing to do with the way you thought about it. These are results, completely general results, and therefore, you know, of much more general validity, independent of whether string theory has any relevance to reality or not. Uh, so it's just an just a, uh, example of if you think about an old problem in an old way, you don't make much progress. You think about an old problem in a, in a new way, sometimes you make progress, and then you realize that you could have done it in the old way as well. So I think this is a kind of a beautiful example of that kind of behavior. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions? Yeah. So, so is there any uh, progress in thinking about a time-dependent marginal coupling? Yeah, uh, the fast scaling behavior actually holds when D is capital delta, so mm -hmm. yeah. that's okay. Uh, but the, the slow behavior, the Kibble Zurich is a little bit a little bit tricky, you know. Okay. I don't think people have looked at it in much detail. Uh, it should be doable, I mean. Well, in, in that case, I have a, you know, a top-down example, you know, well-known example, namely A is 5 cross S5, so eight, N equals 4 super Yang mills with time-dependent coupling. Right. That, of course, so that's, that's, uh, that's one sure. thing I spent a lot of time on in the past okay. as a model for ADS cosmology. Actually. Okay. So we can talk about it later okay. on. It turns out to be excruciatingly difficult. Okay. okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So you looked at the scaling behavior in time, but that, well, sorry, Not in time, but in the quench rate, delta t. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the spatial, so what's the, well, uh, the Lorentz invariance is still preserved in this? It, uh, so spatial diffeomorphism, I mean, the properties yeah, are the same. This is a global quench, yeah. Well, yeah, so, oh, so you assume that the homogeneity of the... Absolutely. Yes. Well, but as you said, well, so the uh, higher K mode well, has a well, higher energy compared to the typical time scale. So, well, uh, in the future language, um, so this well, generally produces uh, particles, right? 
the particle production occurs due to the Borelian transformation. That's right. The, but the particles are like smeared particles all over space. Yeah, but uh, it's uh, the, the fluctuating. So I'm wondering where, but, but the spectrum you, you can expect. The for oh, the fluctuation uh, spectrum. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, that we haven't. That should be readable from two-point functions. Mm -hmm. If you yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cut across the two-point functions, mm -hmm. we haven't quite looked at it in detail. Yeah, and uh, I think it should have some power spectrum, which, uh -huh. which probably reflects, you know, yeah, these so I'm things. Yeah, where the scaling behavior is the same, where because of the the Lorentz symmetry. So, so there are two things. Is one is the whether the driving is independent of the spatial coordinates. Oh, okay. That's what we have assumed okay, okay, here. Okay. okay. Also, it's but that very could very also good. give rise to a power spectrum of fluctuations. Has happened in cosmology. I mean, in homogeneous cosmology, you you know start with the perturbation, it goes through a time dependent phase, and it gives rise to a power spectrum of cosmological fluctuations. There is an analogous question here, uh, which you can obtain by looking at the, at the two-point function, the k-dependence of the two-point function in momentum space. Yeah, right? Because uh, you mentioned that there was <coughs> the subordination. So, where at the same time, where maybe some kind of turbulence may occur. So ah. I'm wondering where, uh, which kind of, so the Kolmogorov type or the that's interesting. I haven't looked at that. The, I would expect there is a cascade in momentum space where you know the energy gets, uh, you know, energy sort of uh, leaks into the modes, and at very late times it's sort of populated by all the modes in you know some kind of Boltzmann distribution. That could be thermalization. But what you are asking is that uh, the 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 whether this cascade itself reflects any kind of scaling. In that I don't know. Yeah, well, so in the cosmology, where well, so people were well, discussing about the preheating mechanism, uh -huh. and I, well, so it's quite similar. To it's me, quite similar, uh, of course, yeah. 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 So, and uh, sometimes, so, well, turbulent behavior occurs. Interesting. And, uh, okay. Something to look at, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other questions, let's thank you. Yep. Okay, so we'll take an hour for lunch. Oh, we are good.